At this point, I was worried about law enforcement because I was at a point where they were gonna check my car. I had started planning a solo run about a year ago. Uh, a lot of people told me, you need to do this. And it was from people that, you know, I highly respected. And I'm looking at these people, I'm like, well, you're the man, you know, you're, you're the fastest out there. You're, you're the guy to beat. I had people coming up to me like, Doug, Doug says, hey, Fred, you know, you know, when are you going to do your run? What are you going to do it in? Last winter after he broke the 27-25 record, we actually had dinner for Christmas. And Doug and I talked over his time. And we, we sat and had talked over, over the last few months. And when we're talking about his time, I told him point blank that realistically, 27, 25, I didn't think was beatable by hours. I felt 27, 25 was beatable by minutes. I, I felt Doug and Arnie had taken some of, some of the time that was known to be left on the table and basically eliminated that gap. So when we had the, the discussion, one of the things we basically said was the only way that it would even be beatable by minutes was if somebody just carefree, no care whatsoever. And that's kind of where I balanced my entire run on is the conversation with Doug that the only way to get to the next level is you have to start changing things that other people didn't do. Number one was the fuel tanks. Number two was a car that was as capable or faster than the last car that set the record. And beyond that, you had to take advantage of things like fuel stops. The fuel stop's probably the biggest advantage of the whole entire run. The, there's nobody that could do this that wouldn't think, not only as, you know, was put in one perspective, bat crazy, but eliminate the stops so you have one stop as adverse to multiple stops. Because as anybody knows, the more stops you make, it, it drags on and on and on and on, and it brings your average down and down and down and down. That was another perspective. Now, being a solo driver, a lot of people you know, have asked me, did I put uh, cameras or did I videotape the run or, or you know, who did this or who did that? And I have to tell people, I, I say, you know texting and driving is illegal? Can you imagine trying to drive at the speed I was driving and make sure everything was refreshed, make sure your GoPro's running, and make sure all that's going on? Because it's just not realistically possible. You're in a different zip code. Even just having two people, having my brother navigate or, or having him be able to spot for cops or, or look the other direction, you know, when, when you're, you know, passing a car or something, it changes the whole aspect of what the run is, is really about. So when people, you know, think of different things about, you know, how did you document or how could you document it? I really kind of was limited based on, you know, who I could tell and who I could trust and be able to still maintain my goal. Because if I didn't meet my goal, then the rest of it didn't matter. So after talking to Doug and talking about some of the issues that he had, uh, I decided to you know, change that up a bit. Basically, it kind of became one of those things that I felt if I didn't do it, I wouldn't just be letting myself down, I'd be letting other people down. When I saw the record fall and we were watching it on Glimpse and stuff and I was calling them out as they were coming into Portofino, I said, man, these guys did this. They don't have any experience. They didn't really even pick a good car. If these guys can do it in this, then somebody with experience really could lay a number down. And honestly, I got on the phone with Arnie, I got on the phone with Doug, I'm like, hey, you guys need to make this happen. I'll do whatever I can to help you make it happen. I'll drive with you, I'll spot with you. You know, if one of you can't go, I'll go. You know, this needs to, this needs to come back home. You know, Arnie and Doug, both great guys. They have their, they have, they're just like me. They have their own thing going on. They know what they want to do. And um, you know, lo and behold, I just started planning my own gig. Basically what we started out with in late April uh, was talking to my brother about coming down and doing a run with him and myself. That changed because my brother couldn't get time off work and as the COVID started going away in our home state, uh, this turned into a, a solo adventure. And solo adventure meaning that I was gonna take the time I had on my hands as I had done over the last few months 
and start planning and prepping a car to make a solo run from New York to LA using a vehicle that was capable of a speed that was better than the Audi and was lighter than the Audi and I could replace the, the uh, people with fuel. So by replacing the people with fuel tanks, I was going to gain uh, by throwing somebody out of the car like every three hours. A lot of people you know, don't understand, you know, gasoline's only like 6.2, 6.3 pounds per gallon. So with approximately 130 gallons added to the car and the seats removed and the spare tire and the, the jack, the rear interior, the rear seats, everything I could take out of the car to lighten it up. By the time I had weighed the car with myself full of fuel, I was actually within the stock parameters of the GVWR of the car. One of the biggest things was being able to have a car that factory could handle the extra weight, but also would be fast enough, you know, in, in stock trim. And money-wise, the best way to do that was go to the rental station and, and rent a car. My buddy dropped me off and I headed to my, my friend Ricky Creekmore's and commenced to tearing the car apart. It'd been there about three hours, walked out the side of the shop, I heard a little bit of a commotion, and there's three goats standing on this rental car that I've literally had for about two hours. So I shooed the goats off the car, got rid of the goats. The biggest thing about the tanks was, a lot of people don't know, but my Cobra from the 2019 C2C runs still in Oklahoma. So we had a 50 plus gallon tank that was custom made for that car for the 2019 run. I started taking measurements out of that, removed the tank from the car, brought it to the, the shop, and it literally was a perfect fit for the car. After I got the tanks done, I made a bracket so I could put the front driving light on. And in order to do that, I trimmed the license plate, moved the license plate up, slid the uh, license plate up, mounted the, mounted the light underneath of it. And at, that was pretty much everything I did at the shop. There wasn't a lot more I did there. I put my antenna in and hooked up my, my small, simple CB. And beyond that, you know, we were pretty much ready to go. I decided that, you know, found the date. I had done a lot of uh, researching as far as to what traffic was flowing where. And we decided the optimal time, which was unorthodox, was to leave during a city day. More often than not, these runs are done on the weekend. But I started noticing as the pandemic had worn off, there was more people traveling on the weekends and less people traveling during the week because at the time we left, it was easier to get out of the city where, where there was people coming into the city. So we literally were in and out of New York in, in pretty much no time at all, which, which allowed me to, to get up to speed and where I needed to be. My brother and I you know, did the balancing act of should it be what time we should do this and what day we should do it. And with him following traffic patterns and me following traffic patterns, we just decided that this might be an optimal window that nobody had possibly chosen before. My shoot time was for 26 hours, under sub 26. We were thinking 25, 30-ish. And you know, like everything, stuff happens on the run. So we got into New York, we're probably around 4 a.m. And I, I sat around and kind of had to wait. Being on a solo run, you don't really have anybody to talk to. You kind of rely on yourself you know, to keep your sanity or, or what, what little I have. I made my own mask so I could pull it up over my face and if somebody said something. Headed out of New York about 6 a.m. About 6 a.m. I uh, got to the tunnel. There was virtually no traffic. It was as smooth sailing as I had ever seen in New York, especially, especially for a weekday. It really kind of played right into our hands. Uh, the first stretch of road we ran, pretty much trouble free. There was no, no cop issues. Probably one of the craziest things across this whole run is I didn't see any lasers. Uh, there was no laser whatsoever, any state anywhere. That was one thing we had planned for and after putting an ALP system in it, which tends to be an expensive system. Fortunately, I had it from, from the previous car run, but we didn't need it. I ne never saw it at one point where I really need it. We made some decent time coming through Pennsylvania. We had some construction. There's a, a pretty good chunk of construction where uh, came through Wheeling. Wheeling, I wouldn't say bottled up, but probably where I ran into first, first bit of traffic with construction. Got to the wrong side of the cones at one point in order to get by some people. The standard of my run, and it's seen in actually one of the pictures and has been brought up a couple times, is my cruise control. Anybody that's ever, ever been in one of these cars before, 
probably never puts their cruise control above 80, 85. So I decided, and we had talked about this before the run, I'm going to put the cruise control on the fastest speed it allows me to. And there's a, the reason for that is to keep myself from getting lazy. Anybody that's done a solo run before, I've done, I've done a couple of them, you actually realize that, oh man, you know, I'm supposed to be going X amount of speed. Somebody's passing me in a caravan. To keep that from happening, to keep the speed up, I put my cruise control on 120 and drove with my foot above that. So at times where maybe my foot had laxed off or my foot got tired or, you know, I had to relieve myself, I, I kept the main team. Now, it didn't stay at 120 the whole time, obviously, but mentally, that was one of the tools that I used to keep my speed and my average up. Other than that, a lot of it was done with calculations from my brother. We made really good time coming across to Ohio. Didn't see a single officer, which was terribly unusual for Ohio. The officers were minimal. I saw a few going the other way. Most weren't running radar. Unfortunately, I didn't have any spotters. But at this speed, it helped me not to have spotters because what I had developed in thinking is driving at this speed and having spotters could draw more attention to actually what was going on, especially during a weekday. Um, to have, you know, four or five different people, you know, going by somebody at a high rate of speed, you take that opportunity of, of getting called in more. So we had no spotters through that end of it. We got through and got into St. Louis, made great time, and then I got a bogey. I had one, uh, an officer that basically paced me for... I don't know, seems like an eternity. It always seems like an eternity. Um, several miles. And I don't know if it was the antenna on the back or, or, or what the, the car kind of stood out, but he paced me. I may have been called in. And, uh, you know, eventually he pulled off. Got into Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa, I got in around a, what they'd be cl close to the rush hour, but Tulsa is a big city. And the good thing about the big cities at, at this time right now is they're prepared for rush hour. They have the lanes, they have the traffic, they have the, they have the ability to handle, handle volumes of cars. So without volumes of cars, there's volumes of room to get through them. Not too many trucker issues. Uh, I had a couple truckers that were, you know, dating each other in the left and right lane. And I radioed to them, said, uh, trying to get through here. And when I think they glanced in the mirror, I think they saw the light bar on the front of the car, which is unusual for a Mustang. And they thought that possibly I was a pursuit car or maybe somebody had radioed to them and told them it was a pursuit car, I don't know. Uh, simple, simple, hey, trying to get through here, kind of slid out in their mirror so they could see the car. Two, maybe three of them promptly pulled over. The rest of them, if I wasn't gonna put the lights on, they weren't gonna care, so. And obviously, you know, I wasn't gonna do that, so it didn't matter. The car spent probably five to six hours, at least, on shut off. At, and and that's, that's not terribly unrealistic. It may have been a little bit more. Uh, obviously, you know, it, it's nothing that you, you log while you're going, but uh, there was times where I would sit rated 159. Anybody tells you a stock Mustang GT goes faster than 159, they're lying. And, and my foot would tell you the same thing. Because it doesn't matter how hard you step on it, how hard you're going downhill, it goes 159 miles an hour. Which at times is frustrating because at opportunities, there was opportunities to probably run the 170s, 180s, but you were limited at what you had, but that also helped me on the other end of my fuel, my fuel consumption. So you start getting up to those speeds, you start burning more fuel. I had mathematically calculated that pretty much 130 was the magic number as far as on the fill-ups. We filled up before, we filled up in the middle and uh, took me to the end. And actually, I, I think I had 39 miles to empty at the end of the whole run. So the, the mathematics and everything all played out and the car balanced really well, and at the ends of runs, obviously, you know, picked up speed. Picked up speed meaning that the, the ideal is you want to get back to your target speed as quick as you can, so you don't, you don't lose on stops or lose on slow ups. The fuel stop was uh, pretty quick. As I pulled into Tulsa, I had uh, messaged ahead to my friends uh, Grant and Brady. Uh, Grant had a, a newer model Chevrolet with a 150 gallon bulk tank, an actual bulk tank used for filling up machinery, farm machinery, and he had a 20 gallon per minute pump. So as I came off the interstate to the toll booth, I could see them parked in stage. Grant told me to pull around the back of the cars 
so that he'd have the pump ready and I had already popped the trunk before I had even got stopped. There's two fillers on the uh, big 50 gallon tank. We use one for the vent and one to fill it or if we're at a pump you can fill, put two in at the same time. We started filling that, it was filled in minutes. While he was doing that, I would quick relieve myself, kind of st stood up, stretched, took a couple pictures, went around the side, climbed into the side, took the caps off, and started filling those tanks, got the back tank filled, and the side tank filled, and I was literally off in eight minutes. You know, quick snapped a couple pictures, you know, thanked the guys. I think he brought me some beef jerky and maybe a water, and uh, lo and behold, I get, a, I get a message from him like two minutes later, the cops are here. And somewhere along the lines, apparently, somebody had called the cops. For whatever reason, either my car had been spotted leaving the interstate and it, because of high rate of speeds going through Tulsa, or somebody had seen us at this little parking lot filling up this car with this great big bulk tank. So I don't know exactly the reason, but the guy got out, I guess, and kind of walked around and didn't see nothing to deal with, and, he, and he's gotten his vehicle and left. Everything was going really well. Uh, my brother was in my ear telling me I was doing decent. I was sending him the, him the shots. He was giving me bullet points of where you need to be, how you need to be, where I fell off. And then I got to California. And I pulled into California, and I don't get stressed out about much. Nothing really bothers me. And there I am sitting at the border at the agricultural stop at zero miles an hour. Sleep deprivation all started setting in going, you're sitting here with a fuel tank next to you, covered up by a blanket. What are you going to do? And as I said, you know, it, apparently it was, it was closer to 20 minutes I sat there. But strangely enough, when you do these runs, usually when you're doing them, everybody's around you so you're you're not worried about the law enforcement at this point you're just worried about the traffic getting out of the way so you can drive fast again at this point i was worried about law enforcement because i was at a point where they were going to check my car and they moved the out-of-staters to one side and they had a guy's car tore apart and i just kept saying to myself that's i'm going to jail i am going to jail and started planning on how I was gonna get bailed out, how I was gonna get the car back, and how I was gonna get back home. So eventually, they ran us through the line and got up to the front and I put my window down and the guy asked me what my business was in California and why I was from Texas and I told him that I had taken a job in California and that I was headed there because I was an essential worker and I was bringing all my stuff with me. He kind of tilted his head, he said, yep, thank you very much, have a good day. The relief was there but I needed to get back on my task of what I was there to do. So I got out of there as fast as I could possibly go. And at that point, it was make or break it. The window had shrunk. Now we're not looking at 25, 30 anymore. We're looking at, you know, can I even do it under 26? So I get into, you know, the area, it starts, it starts getting a little more congested, you know, in the, the downtown Los Angeles area. Everybody knows what I mean, where you're driving in the desert, and you can all out and, you know, the, Pretty much, you know, if somebody catches you, they catch you. And there was nothing, literally flat out as fast as I could run through California, up the hill, down over the sweep, and into the, into, into the city of Los Angeles. Then the lights started coming. And I could see lights in my mirror. And I said to myself, I have got to do something. Because I'm, there's no question, I'm going to jail. There's, there's, no, there's no yes officer, no officer, I'm transferring fuel for, you know, COVID relief. It's, I am going to jail. As he approached me, there was an exit coming up. Immediately got off the exit and I got redirected. So I basically took the series of exits and lost the officer as I got off. It turned me back around so I was headed back the direction I was supposed to. So this is the one time that I can actually thank my GPS for recalculating because it recalculated me that when I got off, it turned me and turned me and turned me and put me back in the same direction I was going. I saw the blue lights disappear and I can only assume he must have taken, taken the wrong direction. Just It was one for four. So he had four directions to choose and fortunately for me, he chose the wrong direction. But at that point, paranoia was starting to set in more. And the sleep deprivation, I was still, I was still on it as far as you know ability and, and awareness and stuff. 
but my awareness was higher and higher because you don't know if he's called ahead, you know, and, and you start going those places. Oh, does he, does he know I'm cannonballing? Did he send somebody to the Portofino and then somebody's gonna be there? As I went down through and, and started, you know, going through the lights and stuff and, and pulling up to the Portofino and I, I, I pull in and I look around, I'm looking around and I don't really see anybody. There's, it's a Portofino, it's four in the morning, you know, four or five in the morning. Nobody's around, nobody's doing anything. I'm from Maine, I'm, I'm thinking like there's gonna be some big fanfare there at four in the morning. I roll into the Portofino and first thing I start to do is snapping the pictures and, you know, sending something to my brother, say, hey, we made it, this is my time. So we broke the 26. And the funniest part of the whole thing is while I'm doing this, my brother's taking my dad to the airport so he can fly into Tulsa, where my house is in Oklahoma, so we can go on the bandit run. So my brother's doing updates. He's been up all, all day and night doing all this with me, and he's taking my dad to the airport. So as, as we're doing it, and he's driving along and takes and he's dropping my dad off, so I get all the pictures and stuff, and I see, I see the caretaker come by on the golf cart, and I'm like, oh no. I quick flip the car around, snap the picture on the front of it, and head it out. Pulled in behind the crab shack, Ripped all the laser jammers, took the, had taken the antenna off, thrown it in my trunk, and literally out of California. The sooner I get out of California, the better. You're here because you like a good car story, but let's be honest, we probably watched enough YouTube videos for a lifetime during the pandemic. It's time to get out of the house and make a story of your own. Extreme Experience puts you in the driver's seat of some of the world's most exciting cars, like this 2020 Corvette C8, at over 30 racetracks across the country. And right now, we're giving away $50,000 to the track experiences and 30% off everything on our website. Head to xxspeed.com to learn more today.